I really think it career provides is a way to stay very calm and very focused and work in work in harmony and manage your response to labor more than thinking you're going to be able to make it pain-free or that you're going to be able to control what it's like because birth isn't really controllable and I really feel that our biggest power is how we respond to what's in front of us we don't always get to choose so having them have skills so they can just... welcome to the journey to birth podcast This episode is an interview that I did with another hypnotherapy for birth approach. This one is with Nancy Allen, who was already a hypnotherapist and birth doula when she came across hypnobirthing. Now, I will let her tell the story about how she found some aspects of hypnobirthing that she didn't quite feel comfortable with and how that led her to creating hypnosis for birth. Nancy is a birth professional after my own heart in that when we see a problem with how it's being done, we just make a new path. One last note, Nancy and I recorded this conversation in early February, so at the time, her focus was primarily on in-office consultations. Now, in this interview, I happened to ask her if she did see clients virtually, which she already was, but now she's taken her entire program, including her free information sessions, and made them available online. So if you're interested in talking with Nancy about her approach to using hypnosis in birth, you can find her at hypnosisforbirth.com. And now on to the show. Welcome to the Journey to Birth podcast. Today I have Nancy Allen joining me. She is a clinical hypnotherapist, a certified counselor, and a birth doula in Seattle and the greater Puget Sound region, where she's been practicing since 1993 at the Eastside Hypnotherapy Center. So welcome, Nancy. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yes, I'm so glad that you're able to join me and we were able to work this out today. So can you first share with me a little bit about your specific approach to hypnosis for birth? Sure. Um, My background is I became a hypnotherapist in 93 and I went through hypnobirthing training in 95. And since then, I've also looked at hypnobabies and several of the other ones. But I was also a midwife's assistant for two and a half years. And between that and the doula work that I've done, I kept learning more and more things on the births and wanting to play with how I was approaching getting folks ready. And so it's been a work in progress continually through the years. And so um, the way I prefer to teach it is so that a woman has the skills to be able to work with her contractions in the best possible way so that when a contraction starts, she can drop in quickly and deeply and ride it out and be back in the room and be present in between. So she doesn't have to feel like she has to stay in la la land through her whole labor. I want her to be able to be present and connected with her partner so that they have a good experience together going through birth. And if she's off in la la land, In some ways, it's like they could be at the pub or something rather than being present because she's not really present. So my goal is that they can be present and aware and still be able to use the hypnosis to help ease the process and give them skills to work with the process. So how did you notice that there was something different in some of the other hypnosis approaches that you wanted to make changes in? Oh, well, right off the bat. With hypnobirthing, they wanted to call everything surges. And I was like, they're contractions. Can't we just reframe what people think of when they hear the word contraction rather than renaming everything? And um, I don't know what they're teaching now, but when I was going through what they wanted the partners to do is to do this really light touch, like kind of very light sweep up the arm through the contractions. And I was like, oh my God, that'd be like fingernails on a chalkboard. I want to hit somebody. So I changed that one almost immediately. And um, part of their thing was to have people imagine wrapping themselves in different colored lights. And I had people going, you want me to do what? And so I think mine's more grounded (laughs) in kind of what's going on. I don't teach people to like pretend they're on a beach or someplace else other than in labor. I want them to be able to be present and know what's going on and experience what's going on, but to be able to work with the, with the experience, to have it be smoother and be able to reduce sensations in whatever way works for them. So when a woman is experiencing a contraction, what do you have her doing in that time? Um, basically, until they get to pushing, their whole job is to be a wet noodle. 
and to really go to a very deep state of focus and relaxation. So they stay out of the way and let their body do what it knows to do. And through the hypnosis, there are touch that touches the partner can do to help them get even deeper faster so that they can get really deeply relaxed, which automatically helps to bring down some of the sensation level when they're not tensing or fighting against it. But also there's hypnosis techniques that actually help to reduce sensation. I always tell people, I don't ever want to promise someone it's going to make it pain-free. And I don't think anybody really can. And it irritates me when I see it on the web. Um, Because there's too many factors. There's the shape of the pelvis, the way the baby's coming through, the woman's ability and to, to work with all of that, and also what her pain threshold is like and how she experiences physical discomfort. So no one can predict how that, what that's going to be like. Um, so my way is to just let them know what I really think it provides is a way to stay very calm and very focused and work in, work in harmony and manage your response to labor more than thinking you're going to be able to make it pain-free or that you're going to be able to control what it's like because birth isn't really controllable. And I really feel that our biggest power is how we respond to what's in front of us. We don't always get to choose. So having them have skills so they can respond in the best possible way and work with their partner so that they're really connected and having a good experience as a couple going through this, I think is what's really the biggest points to want to hit. Yeah, with the partner piece, definitely very important and staying out of their own way. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I really like that approach that you're bringing. So one of the things I always tell people is that, you know, when when you're in a childbirth class, they really, they really don't have the time or the agenda to help you drill down on what are you going to actually do when you have contractions starting? What are you going to actually do with your contraction? And that's where I see mine's a little bit different too, because it's one of the things I really focus on and giving them a structure and a format of how they can respond and ride their contractions. And we, we set up um, automatic responses to help them be able to do that to the best of their ability so that when they start having contractions, they automatically find themselves doing what we put in place. So it's not trying to think about what position should I be in now and what kind of breathing should I be doing now? It gives them, a structure they can lean into, but it also is very changeable in labor. If something's not working, they have other ways they can use it. But I want them to have that knowing what they're going to do when they have contractions, because a lot of people don't have a clue. Yeah, I find a, a lot of people that I work with who've been to a class before, or maybe it's their second or third pregnancy, and they feel like they just didn't get what they needed out of the first ones, they just end up getting a bunch of techniques thrown at them. But then by the time they get to birth, they don't actually know how to apply them or their things are too intense and they just can't remember. Exactly. All that information. So can you That's also why a doula is important. (laughs) Oh yeah, for sure. That's where all of that pressure is removed from that, that memory piece, having to memorize all that. Um, So with what you're teaching, is it, is it very individualized? Do they have a way to figure out what they think they're going to do with those contractions? Yeah. Um, I only teach in private sessions. Oh, so okay. it's only just me and the couple um, or the woman, if she doesn't have a partner at that time, but mostly it's couples. And um, I, I did hypnobirthing is really designed to be uh, group classes. And I did one round of the group classes. I maybe did the second one. And I just went, I don't like this format. Because I felt like I was just spraying out techniques and spraying out ideas and options. But I couldn't help somebody really drill down on what was going to work for them. And so working one-on-one with couples, I can do that. And um, the other piece to that is that the different women have different needs. A, a first-time mom has very different needs than a second or more mom does on getting ready for birth in terms of what, you know, what they're bringing to the table to start with and what we need to clear out of the way to help birth be smoother. So then how many numbers of sessions do you find an average couple needs to be prepared for birth? 
if it's just direct, you know, there's there's no other underlying issues we need to deal with. If someone's got a, a history or a background of abuse or sexual assault or any kind of anxiety or other issues that could get in the way to make things harder for birth, I will often do a couple of sessions with them before we start the childbirth prep sessions. But the actual childbirth prep sessions are only three sessions because it is private. I feel like I can get a lot more done in three sessions than what you can do in a group setting. So these are very specific and uniquely tailored to the needs of each woman or couple as they're coming in. Right. I mean, there is a, there is a basic format of what I teach and how I go about it, but I'm also gauging how they're taking it and how it's working for them. And I can shift it to make any tweaks I need to so that I know it's working for them. But the other thing is I want them to own the skills and not feel like they have to listen to a recording all the way through their birth, which is another thing that I didn't like with the hypnobirthing. Um, it's just like having to ha- listen to somebody talking in your ear the whole time, then you don't own the skills. It's from outside of you. And to me, it's important that they own the skills and have the skills to be able to do this without having to constantly be listening to something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what kinds of things do you see with people in these sessions? The first session is very much informational. I don't do any hypnosis with them on the first session. Um, I go into a, a pretty detailed explanation of what hypnosis is and how it works and how they can gauge what's going on because they're always in control. But what I find is most hypnotherapists don't bother to explain how it all works and how they can tell what's going on because they like, kind of like to keep the magicness of it, I think. And I want people to gauge and know what's, go, what's happening, because if they, I feel like if they know what it is and how, what's happening in that moment, they can relax and get more out of it instead of worrying if they're okay or not, or if they're hypnotized or not, or any of the other stuff that the mind will take off on, stuff on. Um, and then there's a few things on childbirth that I go over. For some people, I'm the only childbirth they're doing, a childbirth education they're doing. And I can do that. Um, I, it's not going to be as deep and as rich as what they'll get into a regular childbirth class, but I can cover the basics and go over things with them. Um, for most people, I am an add-on to whatever other childbirth class they're doing. And then the second and the third session is when we really put things together. So after the second session, We've put things in place for the um, for the contractions. They know how what they're going to do at the beginning of the contraction, how they're going to ride through, and they have homework to do after each session. There's hypnosis tracks for them to start working with after the first one. After the second one, there's more hypnosis tracks as well as the couple doing contraction practices every day using the hypnosis to really get the automatic responses or triggers. We call them in hypnosis typically to get the triggers really and deeply ingrained so that they're there for them when they need them. What is bringing people who are choosing hypnosis of birth, what's bringing them toward that modality? For a lot of people, for a lot of them, um, they're doing an out of hospital birth and they really need to have some concrete skills to be able to deal because they don't have the seduction or the, the option to change their mind and go for an epidural quickly and easily. Um, I also have a lot of folks that want very much want to do a natural birth, but they wish they need to have some definite skills to be able to achieve that. And hypnosis is becoming more and more of an accepted thing and with scientific background to it. So I think it's becoming more, there's more people that are open to considering it. And there's so many success stories out there of people who are using it. And then I also have folks that are kind of, I would say, on the fence where they would like to do natural, but if it gets too tough, they're going to opt for the epidural. And even with those, I feel like there's a good point in labor to get an epidural if you really feel like you need it. And the hypnosis skills are going to help them work to that point and really still feel like they're they're managed their labor well of how they were reacting to it and working with it so that they feel successful in what they did with it. So can you share what a birth looks like when a couple is using the style of hypnosis for their birth? Sure. So a couple of the triggers we put in place, there's some automatic ones I want in place that they don't even have to think about using. One of them is picking out music they want to use for birth. And I always tell them we want to, we don't want their favorite music in the world. 
I don't want songs with lyrics. Um, and a lot of that is because I don't think people want to relive their birth experience every time they hear a particular song. And we are very much triggered by, you know, sounds, smells, situations, people. So I, I think it's, it's very prudent to um, choose carefully what you're going to use for birth music. And I recommend, you know, like kind of like yoga or massage or meditation style music that you could have playing in the background. It's not going to bug you at all. Um, and I have them listen to that while they're doing their contraction practices and anytime they're relaxing. So they build that trigger, that automatic response between that music. Yeah, so what, yeah, once they're in active labor, I, I tell them not to start pulling out all their tools until they really can't ignore their contractions. And oftentimes people have early labor where they, they may need to pause and take some deep breaths and do a little relaxation, but they don't need to pull out all their tools. And then once they get into more active labor pattern to put their music on, and then I also use an aromatherapy blend that I've created out of essential oils, that all of the oils are designed to help promote relaxation and calmness and also help encourage the birth to move forward. But it's a unique scent, so they're not going to be reliving, reliving their birth experience every time someone lights a lavender candle or, you know, or lap vanilla seem to be two of the biggies. Um, so they're very specific and I have them put the oil on or have it where they can smell it while they're listening to the hypnosis track. So we're building a trigger automatically. And then the rest of the, the mom has things that she knows to do, um, a trigger that I give them to be able to just drop in really quickly and, and deeply at the beginning of the contraction. And then the, the partner has physical touches that they can do to help them drop even faster and deeper. So everything's front loaded in terms of physical touches and the triggers on the beginning of the contraction. So the mom can quickly go as deep as she needs to before the peak of the contraction really gets building. And then has the ability to ride through it in the best way she can. And of course, it varies for different people. I have, I have people that come back and tell me they wouldn't call it pain. They would call it a lot of tension, a lot of energy, a lot of pressure, but they wouldn't use pain words. And then I have moms that come back and go, no, it hurt like hell but I was able to stay calm and relaxed and work with it and not fight it. And a lot of what I've been focusing on probably for the last five years is how to support them really dropping back into that mammal brain and how to support what the mammal's going to want and really educating people about that whole mammal brain connection piece. Cause we like to think we're so much cooler than the rest of the mammals, but this is a mammal job. And so to help them be able to know what to do with that. And I think that's part of where the power of the hypnosis is as well, is that it gives the conscious mind jobs to do that are going to get it out of the way and keep it connected with what needs to happen, but give make space for the mammal brain to come forward and do the job it knows to do. Yeah, this is really interesting. I like the layering technique of activating all of the different senses, but in in just the right way that it's not pulling them out of the body. It's able to send them into the body, Yep. but you're bringing in all of those senses so that they have that complete awareness of what their body, all aspects of their physical body are needing. It sounds like, um, yeah, the, um, the music trigger that you were mentioning, I'm not having them bring their favorite music, uh, is interesting for me. I am definitely very sound oriented. And in my first pregnancy, I bought a couple CDs of this local folk artist that came to a bookstore and she played there. And so I bought a couple of her CDs because I really liked them and was listening to them in my first trimester when I had some morning sickness and it ruined it. Wow. I can't listen to her because it brings back the nausea. Exactly. So it's definitely... A trigger. Exactly. That's one thing I warn people of now is in your first trimester, just be very careful <laughs> with all well, of your senses. Labor. labor too. Yeah, exactly. Anything that's going to be that intense, um, because some of that stuff will stick with you. And I didn't yeah. realize how attuned I was to sounds until that experience. So my second we pregnancy, are. I was more careful in the first trimester. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all are. We just don't realize it. But yeah. you know, when you think about Whatever your morning thing is, whether it's coffee or tea or oatmeal, you know, we have responses to those scents when we smell them. 
Yes. Or like the favorite cookie your grandma used to make for you. There's all this emotional reaction, which is the other piece of the trigger. And it's one of the cool things I really like about hypnosis is that we can help unplug old triggers that people don't want anymore and wire new ones. It's, it can feel like magic, but it really isn't. And it can really give them you know, the ability to make some deep changes in a short amount of time. Hi, it's Tristan here. And I wanted to jump in for a quick minute to let you know about a new resource that I've developed for you. 2020 has brought a lot of uncertainty into pregnancy and birth. And I know that it might have you thinking about whether or not you still want to birth in the hospital with all of the increased risks of exposure to COVID-19. If you're considering moving your birth from a hospital to an out-of-hospital setting, I want to invite you to grab a free checklist of what you need to do to make your birth transition smooth and safe. In addition to the checklist, I've included a few bonus tips, such as the three steps you need to take to move from the hospital to a home birth or birth center birth, how to know if you need a childbirth class and how to choose the right one so you feel completely prepared, and I've packed the whole thing full of clickable links to the most helpful resources that you need right now so you don't have to waste your time on Google. Find this brand new resource at naturalbirthcompass.com forward slash checklist. Thanks for listening. And now let's get back to our show. So can you tell me what kinds of things families feel or express to you before they've gone through the hypnosis training and then after they've gone through birth for hypnosis and how, how they approach hypnosis and think about it after they've gone through the experience? Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that I do is I offer a free monthly information session. And I started doing that probably 10, more than 10 years ago now, because there's so many people that are curious about it, <clears throat> but there's no way for them to really find out more before they sign up. And so I do a free monthly session where people can come and I give them a basic overview of what it's all going to be about and answer any and all of their questions. And so I'm finding that that has been a, a wonderful way for people to check it out before they sign up. And a lot of people are um, everywhere from, confu from, from curious to um, really not thinking it's going to work. In fact, I just talked with a couple the other night that they had come and done the training with me and I wasn't available to be a doula for them, but I referred them to another doula and she was with them. And uh, they called to tell me how the birth had gone and it went beautifully. She did a hospital birth. She was able to go completely naturally. It actually went fairly quickly. And um, her husband was so amazed because when he was in the room when she was talking to me and he said, he goes, I really didn't think it was going to work or there was anything to it until I saw her in labor and saw how well she did. And he was, um, he was really surprised. I don't think he really believed that she could get through naturally without without the drugs so oh, that's so good should be yeah yeah for sure how how their that relationship now has the potential to change because of that experience mm -hmm. for both of them so yeah, yeah that's and amazing part, and part of what I really and I don't even I don't hear it so much from the couples as I do from like the nurses when I'm at the hospital with them that they because part of my focus is how they need to be plugged in energetically together in labor. And uh, the nurses, I've had many nurses just comment on how wonderful the dads are, particularly of um, just being really connected and present and working well with their spouse. Because my goal is, as a doula is always that she thought, she thinks he was fabulous and a rock star and I helped. But I never wanted the dad to feel like I replaced him or I've gotten in the way of them, I want to, I want to encourage and promote what they have as a couple to help move through the process instead of it being about me. Yeah, that's so perfect. I think too often we hear stories of they get to wherever they're having the labor or the people get to them and you know, the birth partner really isn't as equipped as they would have hoped when time, the time actually comes and they don't necessarily have the tools to hold that connection. Right. Um, having them feel like they can step in there and be the support person and be the voice and, and 
do the things that they think are right and feel confident in doing that is so important for the experience. It's just as much the birth partner's birth in most cases as it is the person who's doing the birthing. So when they can work together on that level, it just, it completely changes the birth. birth. It really does. Yeah. Everything going on in that room. So. Yeah. And I think that's really important because I, and I, I think birth is a really tough place for men to hang. It's oh, a yeah. really hard place for them to be. And we have, we put a lot, I, I know we did it as a culture to get them into the birthing room because up until the seventies, they weren't, but the expectation that they're going to be the coach or they're going to be the one to get their, their partner through it to me is very unrealistic and it puts them in a really bad spot. And I really didn't have a lot of sympathy for him until my daughter had my first grandchild. And it, I, cause I was then in the dad spot of it was, I would felt I'd, I had be actually hired a doula for her, thank goodness. Um, but I knew she wasn't going to want to listen to me as her mom at that point, but also the, um, just the helplessness. It would have been easier to give birth myself again, rather than watch her give birth. And so it really helped me get what the dad's side was like and shifted how much more sympathy I have and how much more empathy I have for the dads on what they what they go through being in there and watching their partner do this. Yeah, I think helplessness is often in in many of the birth stories that I hear exactly the right word. <laughs> Yeah, they, you know, even even if they've gone through a childbirth class, yeah, and, and exactly that thing where they weren't part of the birth process until very recently in yeah, the history of recent. of birth, and we've kind of just thrown them in there, and we act like we're giving them the tools because they're going to a childbirth class maybe, but it's not enough to really give them the confidence to be the the help that she needs. Yeah. One of the things I always tell the guys is that, um, you know, most men are fix it people. If we gave them the problem and told them fix it, they'd be more than happy to, and they can't fix this and they're half responsible. And yeah. they kind of go, yeah, yeah they, they, they get it. That's really interesting. Uh, but the other thing I tell them is that they are in labor too. They're just not doing it physically, but emotionally, mentally, and spiritually they're in labor too. And so uh, part of my approach is how can I help, them get them ready as a unit to go do this. And then as a doula, how can I support them as a unit and also really support the dads on being able to be present in a way by having their backs and helping them be, be what she needs. Mm -hmm. So I would also really be interested to hear how you started to work with the whole hypnosis thing in the first place. Yeah, it's it's kind of an it was it was actually a side trip that I liked better than I thought I would. I had a background in doing some social services and working in crisis intervention centers. Um, I had worked with a midwife in the late seventies after I had my daughter, and I had stopped when we moved up here from Oregon. And when we when she got into high school, it was like, well, what do I want to do now? And so I became a hypnotherapist at the suggestion of a friend to have a way to work part-time when I went back to school and I thought I was going back to school to become a midwife. And so I um, started doing classes and took, got the hypnotherapy training and then found out about hypnosis for birth her hypnobirthing. I didn't even know it existed until I already gone through the hypnotherapy training. And I was like, how perfect is this? And so I started doing that. And then I very quickly missed being on the births because I had been doing that prior. And so I started taking doula clients of the people I was training. And then I became a midwife's assistant for two and a half years, which was really invaluable for what I was doing because as, you know, as assistant, I was showing up at the births. I wasn't there for prenatals. I hadn't met these people. Some of them were seeing me for training. Some of them, I was also their doula, but a lot of them, I had never seen them or met them before until they got into labor. And it really helped me to see what happens if somebody has trauma or anxiety or an issue that hasn't been addressed yet and they get into labor because there were people I wasn't working with. And what happens when somebody really hasn't done the childbirth prep in any way, shape, or form and gets into labor and how of a huge challenge that is for them to be able to work well with the process. So I brought all of that back 
to my what I was teaching and what I was doing. But the bigger thing that happened along the way was what I realized is I love doing the hypnosis and I love doing the birth doula work and I didn't need to be medically in charge of this deal. And so I've been happily doing <laughs> what I do ever since. And uh, at this point, I've been on a, over 475 births. And so that's, I've learned a lot. I've seen a lot. And I keep bringing things back of, okay, how do I, how, what do we do with this? How do we address this? And how can I help, you know, as a, just a general thing, help people get ready, regardless of which way it's going to roll. So almost 500 births. Yeah, that's a little bit of experience. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so what have you seen change in birth over all that time? You know, it was actually one of my worries when I first got back into working with it in 95. and Because uh, I was like, geez, I haven't really been on birth since like early 80s. And I wasn't really involved with it. And then I got into it and birth is birth. You know, the the um, things I've seen, I don't remember group B strep being a deal when I was first involved with birth. So that wasn't a big, that wasn't a deal. Um, the amount of babies that are born tongue tied now kind of still amazes me. I, I don't get that one. Yeah. Um, possibly related to nutritional deficiencies in moms. That's what I've been hearing or yeah. something about the type of folic acid people are getting for the people yes. that, have, that they're, they can't utilize it. And yeah, so I've, yeah. I've heard that from a couple of people, but it just seems amazing to me that there's so many babies that are getting, getting that. Yeah. And I like seeing nitrous oxide being an, an option for people again. Yes. I think Even. that's a great, I've seen that work really, really well. And I've seen some women that didn't like it. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Just the, you know, the same with any, anything else in birth. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's great that it's becoming more of an option here. Um, I mean, it has been in other countries slow, slow to adopt here sometimes um, in the U S that is. Um, mm -hmm. But even out of hospital now it's being offered. Yeah. Here. I've seen some midwives um, announce that they're now able to have nitrous available for out of hospital births. So that's great. And that's actually where I've seen it is that the out of hospital births, because there was available, was it two years ago or three years ago, the midwives could have it in their practice. And there was a couple of practices that had it and then they took it away from them and now they're getting it back. Yeah. So it's great to see it back. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. I was just talking to a mom recently who was thinking she wasn't going to be able to do an out-of-hospital birth because she was too concerned about the pain. Um, and then it wasn't more than two days later that I saw one of the midwives posted that they now had nitrous oxide. And I thought, well, that's going to make a lot more options for people who don't want to have to make that choice beforehand and yep. feel like they have to be in the hospital because they want to have the availability should they need it. It just expands that option so much. Yeah. And one of the things that I really encourage women to do is to get away from using pain when they describe their contractions. Mm -hmm. It may hurt like hell, but we don't have to call it pain. So I always tell them, you know, we want your contractions to be powerful and strong. We need them to be powerful and strong. And to me, suffering is optional. So it, it's, it's a, how we set our minds on how we're going to respond to this and how we're going to work with it. Yeah, understanding the purpose and what it's doing and how that muscle is working. And mm -hmm. that's what's causing that sensation. And if, if they understand the, you know, this is where the, the childbirth education part of it comes into play, yeah. the nature and the duration and, and things like that, set, set their expectations up, then they can approach it as not being pain, but a sensation. Yeah. Yeah, that's a hard thing I find. You know, it's kind of like the contractions versus surges that you were talking about earlier. The words that we use and setting up the right expectations for people mm -hmm. because everyone's experience is different. Like you said, some people after a birth will say it wasn't painful at all. It was an experience. It was, it was tightening. And other people will completely describe it as pain. And mm -hmm. it's you know, neither of those are invalid. 
the one of the things that I'm really enjoying that they're doing is they've been doing functional MRI studies on hypnosis, trying to see how it works and why it works and what's going on. And there's two of them that I like to tell people about. The first one, they compared the hypnosis to meditation. They wanted to see if there was any similarities. And if there were, what were they? And if there wasn't, what, you know, what's going on? And what they found was when people got to that very focused, relaxed state, regardless of whether it was hypnosis or meditation, the exact same areas of the brain were active. But the pathways to get there were totally different. And to me, it made sense because with meditation, oftentimes, um, it's about just not plugging into thoughts and following your breath and just being still and quiet. And with hypnosis, we tend to use the imagination as the pathway to get there because it's an easier way, <clears throat> excuse me, to corral and to get the conscious mind out of the way. So we have, and it's not what I have them using so much in during birth, but it's the learning curve to get, be able to get to and access that space quickly. And so it's, it's just a different way to get to the same place. And then the other one they did was they wanted to see if hypnosis really did have the ability to impact how much pain somebody perceived. And so what they did, I hope they paid these people well, they exposed their arms to heat lamps and then did a functional MRI while they were being exposed to the heat lamps. And people were rating it as eight plus on the zero to 10 scale of pain. And I hope they weren't like blistering and burning. I'm doubting they did that, but it was hot enough that they were rating it pretty high. And they watched what the brain did on how it lit up and how it activated in response to the pain signals. And then they taught them self-hypnosis techniques and repeated the experiment. And over 80% of the people in the experiment reported the pain levels much lower the second time around than they did the first time. But what I thought was really interesting was the brain activated totally differently in response to the pain. So I'm thrilled that they're doing these studies and helping people know that there is science behind this. It's not, you know, waving clocks in front of somebody's face and kind of woo-woo magic stuff, but there's actually science to this. Right. And nobody's and clucking like we all do. Nobody's clucking like chickens during their birth or nobody, anything like that. <laughs> yeah, I always tell people nobody quacks or barks because of me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so maybe it's not this black and white, but would you, so would you say that hypnosis is able to get people into that brain state faster than meditation is that what they were finding absolutely yeah well and it's a natural state we all go in and out of at varying degrees so when you pull into the driveway and don't remember the last 10 minutes of driving that's the beginning of that place and it's just learning how to develop the mental muscle just like you would develop any other muscle to be able to go to that space when you want to and deepen it and manage it and so the hypnosis is really, you know, I, I always tell people it's really life skills. It's not just birth skills. There are some specific things we'll put in place for birth, but it's really life skills to be able to stay calm and focused and respond well to whatever's in front of you. So then that sparks me to think there might be some benefit to this in a postpartum situation. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I've used, I've worked with, um, well, my practice is actually half and half. Half of my practice is working with people on all kinds of general life is situations and issues. And then half of it's pregnancy and birth related. So I've actually also do hypnosis for fertility and I've supported couples through IVF or insemination, teaching them how to use hypnosis to make those uh, situations more, more manageable, less stressful, and also more successful. And then also worked with people postpartum. You can actually, actually use hypnosis to help increase breast milk supply with some moms that's worked really well. And, and, and helping with postpartum with trauma, um, anxiety, you know, we're dealing with postpartum depression. It works for a lot of different things. Yeah, that's great. Anything that's going to help more than just that one day. Birth is just the beginning. <laughs> Absolutely. It's an important beginning, but it is just a beginning. Yep. Yep. So I would like to know what you wish that all expectant parents knew either before they were pregnant or before birth or before inviting their baby into their home. Oh, that it's an amazing ride. And it's the start of a huge adventure as a couple and as individuals moving into parenting. 
and that it's a little more complicated than the career and the car and the house. So I see a lot of people waiting longer until they have all those other things in place before they have the baby. And I, I think it's amazing that people are doing that. And it also makes it a much bigger lifestyle change and challenge, I think, for couples when they wait to have their babies when they're older. And so just to know that there's, it's a process and there's going to be some challenges and some shifts and changes in your life and uh, your attitude and your way you approach it really defines a lot of how it's going to go. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. So Nancy, can you share with us where couples who are in the Seattle and Bellevue area can find you? Sure. Um, I, my website is hypnosisforbirth.com, all spelled out. And from there, they can uh, contact me by filling out a form to come to an info session or to contact me directly to set up a time to talk. Uh, they can also reach me at my phone at 425-652-9601. Great. And I'll put all that in the show notes too. So you can find Nancy through the links on that on the website there can people work with you virtually i can do virtual sessions i've done a few um i've done some with people who are like on bed rest and they really can't be they they don't they don't want them out of bed long enough to to come to me uh to my office so i can do virtual sessions yes so if somebody was not in this area and wanted to connect with you and talk about booking some sessions um they could connect with you. Okay, great. Absolutely. Great. Okay. Well, I will put all that information up so people can find you for great. That as thanks. Well. Thank you so much for sharing all about hypnosis for birth with us. It was really interesting to hear your very unique approach and uh, where that came from and how you have built this up over all these years, helping all of our local families here in the Seattle area. Well, thanks for having me. I enjoyed talking with you. Thanks. You too. Okay. Bye. Bye, Nancy. Thank you for listening and being open to new perspectives as we spent this time together. You can find Nancy Allen at hypnosisforbirth.com or for those local to Seattle, you can find her office in Bellevue. I will also put her information in the show notes so you can check out her services and find her next information session, which if you're listening when this episode is released, it will be held April 18th, 2020 and will be a virtual session. As always, let me know how I can support your journey. If you have topics you want to hear about, guests you want to hear from, questions or comments to share, let me know. This podcast is always transforming, and you can help shape it into something that helps thousands of families have the best pregnancy, birth, and transition into parenthood possible by leaving a comment or a review or sharing this podcast with others in your life who will benefit from our discussions. Find me on the socials at Natural Birth Compass, or email me at info at naturalbirthcompass.com. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss out on our very next episode. Wishing you a wonderful journey to birth.